George, and thank you, Colonel Robertson, for the invitation to come down here and speak. The topic of my talk is the lesions, the tumorous lesions you find in the dog and the cat. And I'd like first to discuss the ones that come from the mesenchymal elements of the skin, and then afterwards we'll go into the neoplasms of the epithelial tissues. Could we have the first slide, please? By far, the most frequent and the most serious neoplasm we encounter in the dog is the mast cell tumor. It is also found in these species we're mentioning here. In the cat, it usually takes a different manifestation. It's usually a systemic mast cell disease with serious involvement of internal organs, particularly the liver, the spleen, and the lymph nodes. We know that the boxer has a certain predisposition not only to mast cell tumors, but to tumors in general. It is primarily a tumor of late age, six to 10 years, and we know the metastasis occurred at least one-fifth of the cases we've examined carefully. How do they look? Mast cell tumors can take several different manifestations that will often be confusing to the clinician at first observe them. Sometimes it is a normal, or so we say, a lesion covered by normal skin, and there are several of them throughout the skin. Other times, you'll see it invades the skin so heavily that you have erosion of the overlying epidermis. The posterior half of this scrotum is diffusely involved with a mast cell tumor. Here we have the, another example of the multiple occurrence. This is the vagina of an Irish wolfhound, and you can see several excoriated lesions around the vulva, but also several ulcerated lesions down along the backside of the thighs. Here we have another manifestation of the multifocal occurrence, where we have one large lesion here, but in addition to that, there are several focal lesions in the entire inguinal area of this small Boston Terrier. There's another change that is characteristic of the mast cell tumor that can be seen here, and that is the intense hyperemia that is often associated with diffused mast cell infiltration of the skin. The cut surface usually has a characteristic orangey hue to it. Here we have a rather unusual, unusual manifestation, namely a fairly well delineated mast cell tumor. That is not the usual occurrence. Here we have a larger one. This is one of the largest one we have seen, about 25 centimeters in its greatest diameter here, a lobulated orangey mass. Where do they occur? Most of them occur in the posterior quarters of the dog, and there's a particular preference for the very limited skin area that covers the scrotum, the vulva, and the prepus. 13% of all our almost 300 occurred in that very small area of skin. How do they look? It is primarily a dermal invasion of neoplastic mast cells. Here we have a couple of apocrine sweat glands, and you can see all the tissue spaces between the glands and the vessels are filled out with neoplastic mast cells. If you have edema in the area, you can start seeing cytology of individual cells. You can see the borders are usually well delineated. The nucleus is usually centrally located. It's ovoid or round. Mitotic figures are rather uncommon. If you do a toluidin blue stain, you will see a very heavy granulation of the cells and we did it on a Poppenheim on the same tissue block. We'll make another second, you'll see that Una Poppenheim will also stain the mast cell granules. The best stain in our experience is the toluidin blue or a Gimsa modification of toluidin blue, and you'll see the cells, the heavily pigmented ones or granulated ones, you can almost not see the nucleus. It is completely masked by these intensely stained granules. They are metachromatic. The dye is dark blue, but the good stain of the granules will make them a burgundy red color. The uh, reticulum stains will show that there's really no more reticulum in a mast cell tumor than there are in most other round cell tumors of the skin. So it is not a very helpful method. If you do an impression smear and a mast cell tumor along with a lymphoma, are the two tumors where you can do that most successfully. 
and stain these impression smears with uh, ordinary blood stain, Gimsa, or right stain, you'll see a smear somewhat like this. You can see the neoplastic mast cells are about four or five times the size of red cells. The nuclei are usually masked, and you can also see some of the granules have now been liberated from the cytoplasm, probably due to our mechanical trauma of certain cells. If you happen to lyse the granules, what can happen, water will usually lyse them, you see cells like this. Again, the nucleus usually in the center, well delineated cytoplasmic borders, and then no stainable granules. But careful techniques will make a slide look like the previous one. This is just to re-emphasize that most of these mast cell tumors occur late in the dog's age, eight years or older. The breeds, we um, looked into this and again we found that the boxer breed is greatly overrepresented in our mass cell tumor material when you compare with the other cases that come in to the laboratory in this 10 year span. You'll see we only have about 12% of all our dog breeds being boxed in all the other accessions, whereas in the mass cell group are greatly overrepresented. The Boston Terrier is a rare breed in our area, but studies in Boston we did many years ago show that the Boston Terrier has a predisposition to the mast cell tumor. As we mentioned before, the boxer does not only have predisposition to mast cell tumors, but also to certain other types of tumor. And we have listed the ones that are greatly overrepresented in the boxer breed here on top. And you'll see there are certain endocrine tumors thyroid, aortic body, and also seminomas, Sertoli cell tumors, along with these two connective tissue tumors that are greatly overrepresented. Whereas if you look on the epithelial tumors of the dog, you'll see that the boxer has relatively fewer of these common epithelial tumors like mammary, perianal, sebaceous gland, and squamous cell. This material was derived from a study of 750 boxers and compared with 750 non boxers about the same age group and the same time of year coming into the laboratory and we pick these at random. So you'll see that the boxer breed has there are many more tumors in this than over here and you'll also see that multiple tumors in the dog is much more frequently seen in boxer than in the other breeds. The biological aspects of the mast cell tumor, we know that they are, tend to occur in a multiple form. I think about one-fifth to one-fourth of the tumors we see are not solitary but a multiple occurrence. We also know that they have a great tendency to recur after surgical excision. And this particular specimen is going to show a recurrence in the linear scar and also several new nodules coming up about four weeks after a mast cell tumor was removed from the groin of this dog. There's the scrotum and the prepuces here. So recurrences are frequent. Metastasis from the skin into the regional lymph nodes is also common. Here we have a dissected specimen. The penis is sitting here, prepus, and this is the superficial inguinal lymph node, and you can see the border of it here and the whole node plus the skin is diffusely invaded with mast cells. Here is the deep inguinal lymph nodes that are located in the sublumbar area. These are the sores muscles, and you see the lymph node complex here diffusely infiltrated with mast cells. A lymph node that is uh, invaded with mast cells will usually show the mast cells in the marginal sinuses, and I think you can see the medical major here versus the normal staining when the toluidin blue of the lymph, uh, lymphocytes. Here's the lymph node capsule. The spleen is also a favorite site when you have uh, diffuse mast cell proliferation throughout the body with metastasis. And you can see several nodules visible underneath the splenic capsule. The spleen itself was greatly enlarged. Solitary metastasis can occur in the liver, in the kidney, in the heart. In this case, I'm bringing it to your attention because this was the only tumor, a mast cell tumor in the dog, where we did not have primarily skin involvement. It was a solitary tumor in the wall of the colon. 
And this is the only exception we've seen. All other mast cell tumors we have seen in the dog occur primarily in the skin and then secondarily produce a diffuse mastocytosis throughout all organs. There are two biochemical substances that are rather important in the mast cell tumors, and that is the liberation of heparins and the liberation of histamines from cells. Heparin was first extracted from canine mast cells by Oliver on Long Island in 47. We also shown by PATH in 49 that tissue culture systems, uh, canine mast cell tumors will reveal large amount of heparins that we, uh, he could extract. In the murine mast cell tumor, Ono in California showed that there was elevated levels of heparin. In, here, in the urine of people with mastocytosis, Mata showed that heparins were eliminated in urine samples. And then certain dogs, but not all, and probably only a third of all dogs that have carefully been examined will show a disturbed and prolonged clotting time in cases heavy mast cell tumor infiltration. And these are some of the data we accumulated to prove this point. Uh, seven mastocytoma dogs with large mast cells show this clotting time here, and we compare that with 11 dogs of similar size and age, and found this was the clotting time under our technical conditions. The histamine aspect of the mastocytoma is probably even more interesting. Riley in Scotland was the first to extract the demonstrable levels of histamine from mast cell tumors. We know that edema and hyperemia is often seen. We know that there is an anti-mast anti cell response from these corticosteroids, probably due to the antihistaminic actions of corticosteroid. Frank Bloom showed this in 52. And then there are certain changes in the vessels in the mast cell tumor or immediately adjacent to the mast cell tumor that are probably due to liberation of histamines from the mast cells. Kohler was the first to write anything about this particular aspect. The histamine liberation by 4880 was first described by Larsen in Sweden. And then the gastroduodenal ulcers have been seen in certain dogs with diffused mastocytosis of large mast cell tumors, and this lesion can be reproduced experimentally by prolonged histamine injection. How do these ulcers look? It is either in the stomach or in the first part of the duodenum. We have two of them here, and there's a third erosion coming up near the pyloric sphincter. Some of them are perforating, and you can see the effect on this erosion surface of the stomach with a fibrinous localized peritonitis. In addition to that, there are probably also other substances, probably protease-like substances in the mast cells that will, on a certain condition, be liberated and produce some damaging effect on surrounding collagen. And this is what we have named as collagen necrosis. And we believe this is a rather unique feature of canine mast cell tumors. In addition to that, certain vessels will show a fibrinoid degeneration, probably related to both heparin and histamine action. The same for the adventitial fibrosis, in which you get an onion ring-like effect of connective tissue around certain small arteries and arterioles. And then some dogs have more plasma cells in their internal organs, particularly lymph nodes and spleen, than you will expect. And then certain dogs, but few, show a focal glomerulitis that looks different from what you find in ordinary old dogs with glomerular lesions. The last two is probably an unspecific effect associated with advanced tumor formation, but it could also be related to certain substances released by the mast cells. <coughs> the collagen necrosis is characterized by focal areas of necrosis, and we have a surrounding infiltration, usually of eosinophils, and the cells you see here are mast cells. The higher magnification, in which you can see the necrotic collagen, you can see some of the cells being attracted to it. If this lesion persists and you happen to cut sections later on, you'll see that we now have histiocytic cells infiltrating around the necrotic collagen, 
and we are now developing small granulomas. Here's an aniline blue dye where you can see some detritus mass here of collagen and then the granuloma developing surrounding it. If you do a lendum stain, you'll see the normal collagen stain is here and then something happened. You get a change of stain and again the granulomas response for histiocytic cells coming in surrounding it. The sequence of events is very difficult to figure out but from the biochemical stains we had done on these specimens, we know that the collagen will be altered in some way. The fibers are fragmenting. We know there is an exudation of fibrin from the blood and then eosinophils are attracted to the necrotic material and eventually we get the granuloma formation. You will also see that it is not present in all dogs, probably only about a third of them when you look carefully will show evidence of collagen necrosis. The peculiar changes in the vessels surrounding a mast cell tumor we try to show here, where you can see edema of the vessel wall. In addition to that, there are many eosinophils now coming down very close to the subintimal layer of this vessel. These are the mature um, mast cells out here with several eosinophils sprinkled. The changes in the kidneys may be unspecific. We have plasma cells and then we have some of these evidence of mesangial fibrosis, basement membrane fibrosis, and some of them show even something looking like a wire looping effect, again with a thickened basement membrane. The exact significance of that we don't know. We should also mention that in the canine mast cell disease entity, there have been two positive transmission experiments, but in none of these cases did we have the classical cutaneous mast cell tumor. Both were mast cell leukemias, with very high counts of mast cells in the peripheral blood. Louis Lamba was the first to show it and Charlie Rickard showed it in 65. And there's now further work up here, there's probably a virus involved in this particular mast cell disease of dogs. The next tumor that also manifests itself with a round cell infiltration of the skin is the histiocytoma. And superficially, the two can look alike. There are some marked differences, however, that I'd like to point out. First of all, the age of the histiocytoma dog is much lower than that of the mast cell tumor dog. This is primarily a disease of very young dogs, usually two years or under. How do they look? They use these small button-like lesions. It can be on the head, it can be on the leg. You can see this Boston Terrier here near its nose. It has a well-circumscribed little bump. And another tumor here on the ear flap. You can see an intensely red often itching lesion producing atrophy of the hair and then the marked red color. When you cut through them, you'll see a rather diffuse infiltration of the dermis with elevation of the epidermis and sometimes a little erosion on it, mostly due to mechanical irritation from the itching. The size, they're usually small, two centimeters or less. How do they look microscopically? you will usually see an infiltration of the superficial layers of the dermis with often a streaming-like effect from the lower layers of the epidermal pegs into the histiocytic cells. And if you look at a hair follicle, this is an atrophic hair follicle, it is very hard to see the difference between these bottom layers of the basaloid cells and the tumor cells, which is one of the I think helpful features to tell on an H and E the histiocytoma from a mast cell tumor. We know that if we do the metachromatic stains to blue and blue gimsa, we will see that there's no metachromatia. But again, this characteristic streaming effect from hair follicle into the tumor. Sometimes there's an epidermal invasion of the histiocytic cells, you can see epidermis up here and there are little islands of tumor cells within it. How do the cells look cytologically? You'll usually find round cells again with very poorly delineated cytoplasmic borders. The nuclei are usually round, ovoid, or some may be bean-shaped. Very little chromatin in them. And on H and E, it is not that easy to tell it from other round cell tumors like of the skin, like mast cell tumors and lymphoid tumors. But the metachromatia is very helpful. And also, if you do 
electron microscopy, which we'll come to in a minute. The particulum stains is not particularly helpful uh, in the histiocytoma. This is how it will look. If you have to consider the various round cell tumors that occur frequently in the skin, we have discussed the mast cell, and we know this is the key feature here. The gross examination of histiocytoma in A's is helpful. But then we run into an entity here, and we have made at least, I remember two cases where I confidently said, you're dealing with histiocytoma, good prognosis. The animal came back, tumor recurred, and it had a fulminating, what we had to call a reticulum cell sarcoma. We don't know what else to call it, but apparently there is a malignant variant of histiocytoma that on the initial biopsy, you have an awful difficult time telling what it is, if it's the ordinary benign histiocytoma, it's really one of these that may come back as a fulminating malignancy. The venereal tumor, if you have one section and you don't know the site, this can look very much like the histiocytoma. And finally, we have seen two cases of lymphocytoma of the skin. And when you get a biopsy of that, it is very difficult to tell them from the rest of them. The venereal sarcoma first. First of all, we don't see it in the Northeast. It is not a disease that occurs there anymore. 30, 40 years ago, yes, but not today. And here we have the penis of a dog with this cauliflower-like ulcerating lesion. The H and E section will show these round cells loosely scattered in the dermis. Higher magnification will show usually well-delineated borders. This is overstained. And this particular aspect was used by two German authors to tell the difference cytologically under the EM between the histocyte of the histocytoma and the venereal uh, tumor cell with whatever origin it is. In the venereal tumor cell, we usually have great folding of the cytoplasmic membranes, whereas in the histocytes, the cytoplasmic membranes look like this, and hence on the H and E light microscopy, it is very difficult to see this tiny one here. Whereas in the venereal cell tumor, the great folding of the membrane will give the appearance on the light microscope to show that there is a nice cytoplasmic outline of the cells. This is one of our two lymphosarcomas of the dog skin. And you can see you are hard put to uh, tell what it is unless you get very careful history and other information about the case. The vascular tumors, I think these are rare of the skin. The malignant counterpart is very common of internal organs, particularly German shepherds. The glomus tumor, I don't know if there's been an authenticated case yet, but there have been a couple of mentions of it in the literature. The hemangiopericide tumor, I'd like to say a little more about. These two here are extremely rare in canine and feline skin. The canine hemangiopericytoma is a dog tumor of late age again. Most of them in females. The breeds we saw are the ones listed here. The site can be anywhere, but it seems to be a tumor that has a preference for the legs. The size can vary a great deal, up to 25 centimeters. Duration is very unreliable because it starts out usually without much of an elevation of the skin. And then the recurrence is probably around 40%. Here we just show the peak where these occur, 10 years or older. How do they look grossly? It is usually a very ill-defined, ill-delineated tumor invading the fascia, getting on the tendons in between muscle bundles and producing not too, too much elevation of the skin in the beginning. It is usually a very edematous area on top of the tumor with red areas alternating with white fibrotic areas. Here we have a larger one, a lobulated white area, some areas of cyst formation, and then this diffuse infiltration in between fascia bundles. Here's one that was dissected out and it has the appearance of being encapsulated with connective tissue covering these lobulated areas of the tumor. And here is the largest one we saw. This is the olecranon on here, the radius and the humerus, and a huge mass on the inside of the humerus, the lobulated tumor infiltrating widely and deeply 
between muscle bundles. How do the tumor look under the microscope? We have vessels, we have quite frequently perivascular infiltrates of lymphocytes in the hemangiopericytoma. So lymphocytic foci, we think, is helpful in making up your mind if you're dealing with a hemangiopericytoma. Otherwise, loose spindle cells, sometimes with a concentric arrangement, but that's there sometimes and other times it is not. Here you have some tendency here. The cells are quite typical. And again, a few lymphocytes around many vessels. Some onion ring effect here. And the silver stains would be very helpful to pinpoint that these really contain a vessel in the center and then reticulum fibers surrounding them. Then we have another tray with some epithelial tumors and some fibromas. <coughs> It can be very difficult to tell a hemangiopericytoma from the rest of the connective tissue tumors, but I'd like to show you the other connective tissue tumors and hopefully we can get some clues from discussing these. So if you take all fibroblastic tumors of canine and feline skin as one group, I think we should divide in this way. The fibromas, there are at least two different parts of fibroma that one should recognize. The one is the classical hard white fibrous nodule of the dermis. And the other one is a much larger and extremely soft, mushy, almost like a mexoma, with very loose connective tissue. And I don't know if there's any better words in the English language, but this is what people in Europe call it, fibroma durum and fibroma mollet. And then the myxoma is really not much more than a further development of this very gelatinous ground substance that you may find in the fibroma mala. The fibrosarcoma, the malignant counterpart of this, and then perineural fibroblastoma is something Dr. Weiss recognizes in his WHO classification of fibrosarcomas. I'm not quite sure there's reason to divide that from the rest of them. The hemif hemangiopericytoma we have said something about. Another fibroblastic entity in another species that is important to veterinarians is the equine sarcoid. Here we have a very large fibroma mala, a very mushy, pendulous growth on the inside of the foreleg of this dog. Here we have a fibroma durum, a very hard nodule close to the nail bed of this particular dog. How do they look? The fibroma durum is the dense, collagenous tumor, often with fascicles of cells, like a finger painting in the dermis primarily, and then they can extend down in the subcutis and up into the epidermis. Here we have another fibroblastic tumor that we like to call a newer fibrosarcoma, where we have very dense collagenous fibers. You can see it is quite white in its appearance. When you look at the tissue sections, this is the pattern that we like to see before we use the term a neurogenic or neurofibrosarcoma. And these are the very long spindle-shaped cells. The exact division of it, the neurogenic fibrosarcoma from fibrosarcomas is arbitrary at times. The next tumor group will be the malignant melanomas. <clears throat> and I think we immediately must make the distinction between melanomas of the cutaneous membranes and melanoma of hair-bearing skin. The malignancy of any melanoma that is either in the oral mucosa, on the lip, in the vulva, on the prepus, is much higher than malignancy of the melanoma of the hair-bearing skin. This is true in the dog, it's true in the cat. There's one exception in the dog, and that is melanomas that occur near the nail beds. For some reason, they occur there frequently, and for some reason, they seem to be very aggressive and biologically malignant. <coughs> Here we have one of these that occurs near the toes. How do they look? We all are familiar with the picture that may erode the skin, or this was one near the lip, and you see the ulcer here, and then diffuse invasion of the dermis for cells that may contain pigment, 
and may not contain pigment. Sometimes there's a junctional activity, particularly on the ones near the lip, where you can see little clusters of cells within the normal borders of the epidermis. Here we have very little pigmentation, and I think this is quite often the case in many of the canine and feline ones we've seen. The cells are pleomorphous. You sometimes have spindles, sometimes around cells. And the spindle can be very long and look like fibroblast. And the absence of presence of melanin, uh, if it's there, it's fine. But if it's not there, you really have to study the cell pattern. And it seems to us that many melanomas that are amelanotic, they, they're not truly sarcomas, they're not truly anaplastic carcinoma. It's the cell type in between the two. And if you, if you see this pattern, you should think of an amelanotic melanoma. Here we had another case that had tumor in the toes, and you can see the lymphatics draining up to various lymph node complexes with metastasis. And here we have very, very heavily pigmented metastatic foci. Sometimes they are not. Lung metastasis can also occur, particularly when the primary one is in the oral cavity. You can see lung tissue here, and then an amelanotic melanoma. Now the epithelial tumors. The first one I'm going to talk about is the anal or perianal gland tumors or perianal circumanal tumors in the dog. For orientation, I think we should recognize the fact that the anal sac is nothing more than an invagination of the skin underneath the anal sphincter and underneath the epidermis. In the wall of this anal sac, we have two kinds of glands, the basis glands, and modified apocrine sweat glands. And we know that these are truly modified. If you ever smell the skunk or fox or any other the carnivorous animals, the odor is coming from these glands lining the fundus of the gland. The perianal glands are the glands that are found from the duct and laterally, usually about two to three centimeters away from the center of the anal ring. These glands are modified sebaceous glands, or they are really, truly abortive attempt to form sebaceous glands. If you look at dog skin from time of birth and follow it for the first few weeks, you'll see that sebaceous glands will develop here, and then the superficial portion of these solid structures undergo sebaceous transition, whereas the bottom part remains solid, and these are the glands that later become the so-called perianal glands. So in the very young animals, these are in one adnexal complex with the top part undergoing sebaceous transition, whereas the bottom part remaining solid. And then as the dog grows older, these, particularly in the male dog, keep on growing and remaining solid. There's no known function as far as we know. There's no duct system. Once in a while, you'll find a small lumen like a keratinized cyst within solid masses of this, but as, as far as we know now, no function. This is the dog, and most carnivorous animals has more or less this same picture here. In the cat, you do not find perianal glands out here, but there's in one side of the sac, a small cluster of solid structures that resemble very closely the perianal glands of the dog. Here we have a perianal glands. This happened to be from a skunk that was dissected out. And you can also see a nice little nipple-like arrangement there. So the skunk is truly capable of aiming uh, this particular material when he squirts it. The lining here is just squamous epithelium. And then in the center, we have this mixture of sebum and modified apocrine sweat. This is the anal sac wall of a cat in which we have these modified sebaceous glands, or so-called perianal glands. Just one large cluster. And I've never seen tumors of those in the cat, whereas in the dog, they have very frequent tumors. How do they look in the dog? I think you've all seen it. Just This is the uh, lateral side and dorsal side of the anus, a very well circumscribed, ovoid growth covered with skin. These can be multiple. This is a cocker spaniel where we have several localized and separate areas of perianal gland tumor information. And you see the causes 
some trouble in the overlying epidermis and the vessels with edema and stasis. Where do they occur? By far, most of them occur right around the anus or related to it. But several of them, we have seen 19 out of these 250 that occur up underneath the tail. Some occurred on the prepus, down on the hip, and some, at least only one here, but these are the ones that cause problems. When you get a lesion from this area and then you get the diagnosis back, appear in gland tumor. But remember, there are scattered glands, so these solid sebaceous gland found throughout the rear quarters of the dog, and these can all undergo uh, neoplastic transformation. How do they look? These are the little keratinized cysts. They are not duct structures because no secretion has been associated with them that are found in canine perianal gland adenoma. Once in a while, and that is a rare thing, you'll find truly malignancy of the perianal glands, but it is a rare occurrence, and out of the 300 we studied, there were only there were 10 or less that we can say were truly malignant, and all of these 10 that we thought were malignant, only three showed biological proof of malignancy with metastasis to the regional lymph node. Here we have one of them, and you can see the cells here are quite different from those of the normal gland and also those of the adenoma. We have no visible cell borders, there's lack of polarization of the nuclei, and very little lobulation, as usually is the case in the perianal gland adenoma. Here we have one of the ones that metastasize. This is the internal iliac arteries bifurcation. This is the lymph node, and here we have tumor in the lymph node. I think the next slide is the histological view of that, where we have uh, lymph tissue here, and then this is the perianal gland tumor in the lymph node. The sex is of interest because there is a relationship between male hormone and the formation of the perianal gland tumors. And if you look here, you'll see the intact male by far is the most frequent one. Females are 10% of the male in frequency. There is very little seen in the castrated male. And the spayed female is almost as high as the intact female. So apparently, the male hormone is responsible for the active proliferation of these glands during the life of the dog. Now, other types of epithelial tumors of canine and feline skin. And the first one we should go to is the basal cell, then we'll talk about the prickle cell, and finally, on the squamous cell, and that should be the end of the talk. Um, the site of the canine basal cell tumor is somewhat similar to the site of the human basal cell tumor. Most are found in the head and neck area. And this is true in several studies, head in Scotland, ours at Ohio State, and then Bosnia and Weiss in Germany. So these two areas are common site for the basal cell tumor. How do they look? Basal cell tumors are very firm, well delineated. You can usually lift them up over underlying structures as long as they're small. You'll also see this artist drew it with primarily a popping up and elevation of the overlying epidermis, very little downgrowth. Here's the actual specimen of another one where you can see the skin line was here and then some loose connective tissue surrounding the bulk of the, of the uh, basal cell tumor. Again, well-encapsulated, lobulated tumor. Histologically, one could divide it up into three different manifestations of the architecture. Uh, the only reason we're doing it is try to see if there's any difference in the biological behavior between the three types. Um, we have found out that the solid variety in which you have solid lobules and masses of cells with very little collagen is the one that may recur. There have been few instances of recurrence of basal cell tumors in dogs. 
whereas the ribbon type, where we have these long strands of cells surrounded by dense collagen, is benign. And the medusoid, in which you have ribbons sometimes fusing together, like a starfish, is probably in between in biological malignancy between the two others. Here we have the solid type. And you can see it looks very well delineated here. The overlying skin is often showing some atrophy. And then you have this very large mass without any uh, great amount of connective tissue between the individual epithelial elements. Here we have the medusoid type where we have some serpentine strands and then some of these will meet and produce this medusa head-like structure. The ribbon type, this happens to be from a cat, will show these long strands of tall cylindrical cells, usually one or two layer high, separated by connective tissue elements. And another one here, and you can also see the similarity between the outside layer, the hair follicle, and some of these uh, basaloid cells from the basal cell tumor. Here we have the uh, long strands of the ribbon type. And despite the fact that it may superficially look like an invasive growth, it is not. We reserve the term basal cell tumor to this well-demarcated lump showing no visible differentiation towards any known element of the skin. If it shows towards sweat gland, we call it sweat gland tumor. If it goes towards basal cell, or not basal cell, but sebaceous, we call it sebaceous. And hair follicle, we call it hair follicle tumor. <clears throat> Some of these will have the adenoid differentiation towards either sweat or sebaceous. But then we use these other terms. So basal cell tumor is used when it does not show any visible differentiation. These are the three directions in which they can go. We should say a little more about this and this. The mummifying epithelioma, the cells at the perimeter of this tumor looks exactly like the basal cell tumor, but for some reason they will die out in the center and then you have this large mass with a necrotic center and then viable cells at the perimeter. Here we have the trichoepithelioma, epithelioma where we have some basaloid-like cells forming attempts to make hairs and you can see the various degrees of keratinization in the centers. And another one here with small basaloid cells at the perimeter and the hair follicle structures. And here we get into what we call the mummifying epithelioma, where at the very periphery there are basaloid cells and then there's a very abrupt transition into cells here that now show no good evidence of keratinization in the beginning, but up here they do, and then they undergo death cell deaths. You have all the ghost cells present in the center. And here's another one, where we can see basaloid elements and then into the mummifying epithelioma. This is a benign structure. Some of these will, I'm sure, undergo calcification, and then we should call them calcifying epithelioma, but in the dark skin, many of them remain just as mummifying epitheliomas. The calcifying epithelioma is, I think, recognized by everybody. And also, its transition, in my opinion, into what we call calcinosis circumscripta. When you see the gross slice of these, some of them you cannot tell apart. This material could be keratin, milk-like substance. If it mineralized, when you dry the specimen, you'll find that it's a chalk-like white material that may fall out. So they look very much alike. Here we have a mummifying epithelioma that is now starting to calcify. You can see the calcification down here. And now we're getting into calcinosis circumscripta. And my point in showing this sequence is that we don't know the cause of calcinosis circumscripta, but I think there are four different possibilities that must be considered. Uh, Dr. Ann Jabara in Australia and Don Cordes in California feel that most of calcinosis circumscripta in dogs at least is retained material in cystic apocrine sweat glands that will attract mineral salts. 
and undergo calcification. We know that in other species of animals, certainly that pressure necrosis, particularly in heavy breeds of cattle, horses, will produce necrosis that may calcify. And I think some of them are burned out calcifying epithelioma that undergo complete mineralization. Hanselli had shown that calciphylaxis will produce this type surrounded by giant cells. And then the old German term for this disease, calcium gout, is related to renal disease that is found in some dogs with calcinosis circumscriptor. <coughs> How does calcinosis circumscriptor look? The classical example is what we see here, these lobulated white chalk-like structures in the deep in the dermis. <coughs> Once in a while, <coughs> they're found in the tongue. Some cases have been found in the foot pads, so they're not always related to the sweat glands, as it has been claimed that can occur in areas where sweat glands of the apocrine type is not found, are not found. Here's the foot pad one, and this is uh, the cross section of the foot pad lesion, which looks exactly like it does in the skin. And the classical example is these mineralized foci surrounded by giant cell reaction. Here we have the giant cells and then we have some of the apocrine sweat glands and a very heavily chalk-like mineralized material. Tumors of the glands of the skin are two types in the dog. We have sebaceous gland tumors, which is the most common epithelial tumor of the dog's skin outside perianal and mammary gland tumors. And then tumors of the apocrine sweat glands. And tumors of the apocrine sweat glands, the dog, and in most other species, look like the tumors of the canine mammary glands. You have the same types. We have mixed tumors with cartilage and bone of apocrine sweat glands. Here we have a cat with an apocrine sweat gland tumor producing much discoloration in the overlying skin due to stasis. It is a classical adenocarcinoma with these cells, usually two layer high, forming cystic spaces. Another one here that is much more malignant. And you can see the similarities here between the basaloid cells and the apocrine sweat glands. This could be an in-between stage, but there are other areas of this tumor that had good sweat gland uh, maturation. Here we have a mixed sweat gland tumor. You can see the chondroid matrix here, and then the adenocarcinoma part up here. Another one here that did not develop fully a chondroid maturation in its stroma, but it remained mixoid. So here we have a, a mixed apocrine sweat gland tumor with probably a mixoid element. The epitheliomas, as we mentioned, the sebaceous gland tumor is by far the most common one. Basal cell number two, and then the squamous cell and the sweat gland here fall further down the list in frequency. The sebaceous gland tumors, I think we have to recognize three stages, and it is very difficult to separate the anonymous hyperplasis from what some people call adenomas. So we reserve the term adenomas for a fully developed localized lesion. And then finally, the carcinoma, which is very rare, and usually clinically of a rather benign behavior, despite the fact it may have a big crater-like ulcer on top of it and be large. They do not metastasize. Here we have a sweat gland adenoma. And you can see basaloid cells with good evidence of sebaceous maturation in certain parts of the tumor. Here we have this one we call sebaceous gland adenocarcinoma, much more uh, solid and much more aggressive. The acanthomas, <coughs> which is the next layer up from the basal cell, the prickle cell layer, there are two types. The most common one is the so-called keratoacanthoma, or the Germans like to call a keratinizing epithelioma. And then we've seen two cases of what should be called an adenoacanthoma, according to Lever, who has, was probably the first one to describe that, in which this particular tumor shows, for some reason, a glandular transformation, and it is believed to develop in sweat gland ducts. 
The Kirtweta Toma can also be called these things here because it is a benign tumor that will often burn out and heal and the Germans call it cutaneous cornifying epithelioma. How do they look? They are usually elevated. If you're lucky in your section, you may find a crater in the center and then a lot of keratinized debris that if you squeeze it, it may pop up. And these are very easy to remove and they may actually burn themselves out and heal spontaneously. And the biggest difficulty here is to separate it from squamous cell carcinoma. And I think um, this particular example is not difficult. We have the crater-like center here and then the cells at the perimeter and there will be no basiloid cells found in the perimeter of the uh, cornifying epithelioma. Here another section of the same, these large prickle type cells with marked tendency towards keratinization. These are the criteria that Helwig set up uh, that one should have in order to use this term keratoacanthoma and particularly to be sure you're not dealing with a squamous cell carcinoma. And we mentioned this before and there's no separation of the bottle layer down into deeper structures like you'll see often in squamous cell carcinomas and secondly, normal epidermis at the crater at the edge of this hole in the center. Here we have our one of the two cases of keratin or adenoacanthoma where you have acanthoma growing down and then you now start seeing glandular development. I think the next slide will be even better. This is deeper down where we have definitely a glandular tumor and this happened to be uh, looking somewhat like some sweat gland tumors but it had this large proportion of acanthoma towards the top of the lesion. And here we have another shown acanthoma and then some sweat gland like structures that was helpful for us to make the diagnosis. The Last group I'm going to show will be squamous cell carcinoma and here we have a large ulcerating one. Here we have another dog and you can see several separate lesions on the skin. We also know that in cats, in the white cat, it is one of the most common lesions on the tips of the ears and on the bridge of the nose due to UV radiation. Uh, we have squamous cell carcinoma growing deep and this is cartilage at the very bottom. This happened to be from the pinna of a cat where the tumor has destroyed most of the pinna and now getting into the cartilage. Here we have a squamous cell carcinoma from the nail bed, the same area where the malignant melanoma has a, a frequent occurrence where the tumor cells, despite the fact that they're very well differentiated, are now getting down and destroying underlying bone. And another view of a squamous cell carcinoma. And this is what one can use as a helpful differential diagnostic uh, feature from the care to acanthoma. The separation of the bottom layer of individual islets of tumor cell away from the main bulk of tumor. Here we have a cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma from a cat metastasizing to the eye. And you can see how well differentiated the metastasis.